the Department of um, Brian Joseph of the Department of uh, Slavic and East European Languages and Cultures. And it's my very, very great pleasure to welcome you all here to what has definitively and definitely become a major yearly event for the department and for the university, I'd like to think, and we can say for the world. Uh, that is the annual Kenneth E. Naylor Memorial Lecture on Balkan and South Slavic linguistics today in its 23rd installment and the first done in virtual mode after years of in-person gatherings. We're here with former colleagues, friends, at least one former student and former Naylor lecturers. In the past, I could say with family members too, but uh, 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 no family members were able to attend uh, today. Um, folks from uh, around the world actually and a gathering to commemorate a sad event marking the end of a happy and productive life, but at the same time to celebrate that life. On March 10th of 1992, South uh, Slavicists, Eastern European specialists, linguists, family members, and colleagues here at Ohio State, around the country and around the world, lost a valued and esteemed loved one when Kenneth E. Naylor, whom we all remember as a fine scholar, a uh, fine humanist, and a fine human being, passed away uh, tragically and all too young just after his 55th birthday. I'm going to um, share my screen for a moment and let you all see uh, Ken in his uh, younger days. In 1992, when, uh, when Ken passed on, I was uh, but 40 years old and Ken at the time seemed so much older. He was 15 years my senior. Now at age 69, I'm almost 15 years beyond Ken. And I can see how young he really was when he left us. And that's how much we actually lost in both human and terms and scholarly terms through his early demise. Ken began at Ohio State in 1966 after teaching for two years at the University of Pittsburgh. As best we can tell, <clears throat> he was the only African-American Slavicist of his era. And he may well have been the first African-American PhD in Slavic studies ever and certainly one of the very few even now. This fact was noted a few years ago at Pitt during a special symposium on African-American perspectives on Russian and Slavic studies. Ken has left a rich and important legacy here at Ohio State where he served as a faculty member for 25 years for he donated money in his will to create the professorship in South Slavic linguistics, which I am proud and honored to currently hold. To recognize Ken's intense interest in the Balkans and to memorialize his love of scholarship, with the concurrence of the uh, Slavic department chairs, I've instituted various initiatives over the years and they have borne fruit in wonderful ways. For several years, we had the annual Kenneth E. Naylor Young Scholars Prize, <clears throat> recognizing in an international competition, the best paper submitted in South Slavic or Balkan linguistics. So we, several younger scholars whose interest in South Slavic, we know that Ken would want, want to nurture, were recognized in our annual competitions. More recently, we have established an award in the Slavic department here honoring the best student in a Balkan language or Balkan course in a given year. But most visibly, we created in, in connection with the professorship that bears his name, this annual lecture series that brings a leading scholar in Balkan and South Slavic linguistics to campus for a public lecture and an extended visit. Unfortunately, not this year, but we have Mark, uh, our, our speaker, virtually with us. We now publish the text of the lectures in monographic form, the latest ones coming out through the auspices of the journal Balkanistica. Previous Naylor lectures have been given by a veritable who's who of Balkan and South Slavic linguistics, 22 scholars in all prior to today. We have a, a plaque, part of the permanent wall decoration hanging in the Department of Slavic and East European Languages and Cultures in Haggerty Hall on campus that commemorates all the Naylor lecturers. And if we're able ever to return to Haggerty on a regular basis, you can uh, stop in and see it in the Slavic department. To turn to today's affair, <clears throat> this year we have the great honor of welcoming to our virtual presentation yet another distinguished scholar, Professor Mark Janse of Ghent University in Belgium. I'm especially pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Janse, Mark, as he has been a dear friend for some 25 years, a frequent guest in my home and I in his, uh, over that time and a collaborator on various projects and papers. 
He was to have been last year's Naylor lecturer, but COVID intervened. So today is a chance to make up for that gap and to move in the direction of uh, return to normalcy. He is the Bofzop uh, Research Professor in Ancient and Asia Minor Greek at Ghent University and Associate in Greek Linguistics at Harvard's Center for Hellenic Studies. He has numerous awards and recognitions that attest to his stature as a scholar. He is a former visiting fellow, twice actually, at All Souls College uh, in, uh, at Oxford University also a fellow of the Onassis Foundation in Greece, also twice, and a former fellow and associate of Harvard University's Center for uh, Hellenic Studies. In addition to being the Naylor lecturer, Mark was to have been the Gaysford uh, lecturer at Oxford University last year, another prestigious endowed lecture. His research interests cover the history of the Greek language from Homer to the modern Greek dialects of Asia Minor, and he is one of the few scholars in the world who cover that long span, some uh, uh, 3,500 years or so of the history of Greek. His interests include word order, versification and kilometry, uh, also profane, obscene uh, language, uh, language contact between Greek and other languages such as Hebrew, Aramaic, uh, Turkish and Armenian in particular. He's published extensively on Cappadocian, including a comparative grammar sketch of the dialects. And he is without a doubt the leading authority on this variety of Greek. He's also a specialist, as you will see when he shares, when, when you uh, see him uh, and his background. He's also a specialist on the life and music of Frank Zappa, the, <clears throat> um, so that blending that expertise with his deep knowledge of Cappadocian makes him the only Zappadocian scholar in the world. He's with us today, despite uh, currently being on sick leave, which is a testimony to his dedication to scholarship. After last year's cancellation, we figured that another <clears throat> cancellation should not happen. And so here we are. Please join me in welcoming Mark for today's Naylor Memorial Lecture. He'll be speaking on Cappadocian, Asia Minor Greek, the life and times of a language once believed extinct. So on over to you, Mark. Thank you very much, uh, my dear Brian. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, here with you all today. Um, unfortunately, it's a virtual uh, meeting, but uh, it's the best we can get under the circumstances. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, let me see if I can uh, make this happen. It worked just now. And can you see it now? Not yet. <coughs> Not yet, let me see. Not yet. Okay, so maybe I should click. There, there, now it's just starting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and it's in the presenter mode right now. Yeah. Ah, there we are. There you are. Okay, good. Perfect. Uh, Perfect. So this, okay, good. Um, I'll just start my talk. Of course, in the background, what you see here is Cappadocia, the famous uh, rock. Um, well, the strange uh, rocks you can see in Cappadocia. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know where Cappadocia is located, here is a, a map of Turkey and the rectangle shows you the area where Cappadocia is roughly uh, located. It was much bigger in antiquity, but this is the rectangle uh, in which the Cappadocian dialects, the modern dialects were once spoken before the population exchange between Greece and Turkey, of which more uh, in a minute. Um, this is an old map of Asia Minor. It's a, it's a modern map, of course, but this is a map where you can see the Anatolian languages plus Phrygian uh, languages that were once spoken in the area in the second and first millennium BC, but they were, uh, as many other languages, they were actually um, uh, Eraded by Alexander the Great, not by uh, Alexander in person, but by his successors and the Hellenization of these areas which uh, followed on his uh, conquests. I'm not going to talk very much about the history because I want to move on to the later stages of the Cappadocian language. This is uh, an important date in uh, the history of Cappadocia. <coughs> this is the division of the Roman Empire in uh, 395 at the death of. Theodosius, Theodosius the Great, who made Christianity the state religion in the Roman Empire, but then died, uh, and the empire was divided between his two sons. Um, you can see it's, uh, 
the Eastern Roman Empire, you see it's the yellow uh, uh, area. Um, the state borders are uh, marked, but you can also see this dotted line here, which is a, a linguistic uh, boundary. And you can see that uh, the Greek speaking area extended into Southern Italy and Sicily, where actually not in Sicily, but in Southern Italy, there are still pockets of Greek speaking uh, people uh, left. They, it's a very highly endangered variety called Greco or Grecanico uh, in Southern Italy. Cappadocia was uh, located um, in the, let's say, Byzantine heartland, but I, I would like to uh, emphasize that the Byzantines, as we are used to calling them, uh, refer to themselves as Romans. After all, they were the, uh, the heirs of the Roman Empire, and so they continue to call themselves uh, Romans, Romei, Romni, and the language even was called Romeica, so that's the language of the Romans, but of course not of the Western Romans, but of the uh, Eastern Romans. We skip a few centuries and end up in the 11th. Um, this is a map of the Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire at the death of Basil II, Porfiro Yenitos, uh, nicknamed the Bulgar Slayer. I need to throw in some Balkan uh, terminology uh, every now and then because this is, after all, uh, a Naylor uh, memorial lecture. The Bulgars are, of course, not the Bulgarians. Uh, they refer to uh, a Turkic uh, tribe uh, who invaded, though, what is uh, nowadays Bulgaria, and they gave their name uh, to uh, the state uh, as well. This is an important map because you see what was at the time uh, the Byzantine Empire at its largest extent. Um, it had been a, a lot smaller uh, recently, recently before 1025, that is. But things were to change drastically. Here you see um, a, a, a place called Manzikert, which is in the eastern part of the Byzantine Empire. It's Arme Armenian territory, actually. And near that place, near Manzikert, was fought a battle between the Byzantine army and the uh, Seljuk Turks who invaded uh, Asia Minor and actually the uh, Near East uh, in uh, that time, at that time. This is um, a modern or a relatively modern painting uh, of the battle. Uh, and you can see the leaders of the two armies uh, depicted here, Alp Aslan, who uh, was the leader of the Seljuk uh, army, and Romanos IV, uh, whose uh, nickname was Diogenes, uh, born of God. That was a bit cynical, the nickname, because it didn't help him very much in the battle because the Byzantines were defeated. Romanos, as you might have gathered, uh, means Roman. It was a, a loan word from Romanus, and it indicates that uh, the Byzantines still felt their Roman heritage uh, very much, even at that time. This is a map of the Seljuk Sultanate, uh, and you can see the date that is given here is uh, 1096, that is barely 25 years after the Battle of Menzikert. And you can see that Asia Minor is almost entirely conquered by the Seljuks. Um, this is, um, when you think of, about the end of the Byzantine Empire, uh, which we usually set uh, at 1453, when Constantinople fell to the Ottoman Turks, uh, led by Mehmed II, uh, you can see that the Battle of Manzikert is, in a way, really the beginning of the end of the Byzantine um, Empire. And it is really the end of um, Hellenism, or uh, a large part of Hellenism in Asia Minor. You can see the circle that the territory um, is called Rum. Um, actually, the Seljuks um, uh, installed the Sultanate of Rum uh, in the center of Asia Minor around Konya, which you can see uh, here. This is uh, Konya, Ikonion in uh, Greek. Uh, and Rum is um, nothing else than um, the Turkish, and actually it's, it's the Persian uh, version, was borrowed from the Persians, uh, of the Romei, of the Romans. Uh, so the, the name Rum 
refers to the Greeks of Asia Minor, uh, the, uh, the, who call themselves Romans still uh, in those days. This is a map where you can see the Ottoman conquests uh, extending uh, to uh, Greece and the Balkans. And uh, well, uh, you can see that this was a huge uh, empire. And uh, at the fall, uh, at, in 1453, at the fall of Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire was little more than Constantinople and some of its surroundings and some pockets in the Peloponnese, which was called the Maria uh, in uh, those days. Um, as you can imagine, uh, a conquest of this extent had uh, its impact on um, the social and cultural, uh, cultural relationships uh, in the area. Uh, and as very often, uh, language was involved. Uh, even uh, in the century after the Battle of Manzica, we, we have testimonies that um, you know, many, many uh, Greek-speaking Christians, uh, you know, the Greek-speaking population was obviously uh, almost entirely uh, Christian. Um, they shifted to Turkish following a period of bilingualism. Um, and uh, this is a report from 1437, um, where you can read, uh, it's written in Latin, uh, that in multis partibus turci, in many parts of Turkey, uh, you can find reperiuntur clerici episcopi et archiepiscopi, uh, priests, bishops, and archbishops qui portant vestimenta infidelium, who wear the clothes of the infidels, of the Turks, that is, or of the Muslims, if you will, at locuntur linguam ipsorum, and speak the language, at nihil aliuciunt in greco profere, and they don't, they can't say anything else in Greek, nisi misam cantare, except sing the mass, that is, uh, the psalms, at evangelium, and the gospel, and epistolas, and the epistles, alias autem, uh, autem orationes, but all the other speeches dicunt in lingua turcorum, they, uh, they say in the language of the Turks. This is remarkable. Uh, you see here a uh, testimony that Turkish was actually used even in church, except from you know, the, the Holy Scripture, which was read in Greek, but that must have sounded like, uh, well, Greek to um, the uh, flocks uh, in church at the time, at least in those parts of Asia Minor where Turkish had, uh, um, uh, had been taken over by the Christians uh, who couldn't speak and understand Greek anymore. This is an example um, of the Turkish used, uh, spoken, and also written by uh, the, uh, the Christians who had uh, shifted to Turkish. They are called Karaman Lides, after the Karaman area, uh, which is located south of Cappadocia. Uh, and what is remarkable is that they, uh, they use the Greek script to write the Turkish. It is called Karaman Lidica, both the writing and the script. Uh, there's, of course, nothing unusual about using um, a different writing system uh, to write uh, a language. Think of the Cyrillic script, which is used to write a huge variety uh, of languages, including Turkic languages uh, in the former Soviet Union, um, uh, etc. And of course, the Roman alphabet, which is used for even uh, more languages. But if you can read Greek and you start reading this, you will soon find out, uh, as I did to my frustration, that this is not Greek, but in fact Turkish. Although, if you read with me, um, you see Tarikunde uh, Bu Serif, that is Turkish, but here ekklise, you see the beginning of a Greek loanword, Ekklesia Church, which was borrowed uh, in the Turkish, uh, Aya Eleni, the uh, Saint Helen, uh, Michael uh, Archangelas, the Michael the Archangel, and then it goes on in Turkish, etc. This is one of my favorite inscriptions in Karaman Lidica, not because it's just a beautiful one, but also because, yes, it has the name of my hero Zappa uh, right in the middle, well, also uh, almost right in the middle. It's of course not Zappa, but it you know, caught my eye the minute I saw this inscription. Uh, this is another example of Karaman Lidica. This is an, a translation of the uh, Old and the New Testament. Um, you can see the Greek letters 
if you look very carefully, you can see the little dots on the P and the TAF here. Um, they are diacritics to, um, to write um, the sounds that are, uh, that you cannot uh, write using the Greek alphabet. So for instance, the P, the P with the dot is the B, um, the voiced labial stop because the Greek letter beta was pronounced vita, it had become a fricative. Um, similarly for the T with a dot, the TAF with a dot, it's for the voiced dental stop or alveolar stop, I should, I should say, because delta had become a fricative as well, delta. And here you see the translation, uh, Arde, Atik, Arde, Jedit. It's the Old Testament and the New Testament. And here it's even written in Greek, Palya, Ve, Ve is Turkish. So the Old and in Turkish, Nea, the Atiki, the New Testament. This part is written in the uh, Ottoman alphabet, which is derived from Arabic, uh, as you can see. And it was pr printed in uh, Istanbul. Uh, here in 1884. If you uh, take a look at the table of contents, you will um, perhaps recognize the name of uh, the four <coughs> Gospels here, Injil, which uh, is uh, a Greek loanword that via Arabic came into uh, a, a Turkish uh, Gospel. And here you see the name um, of the four, Ma Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and if you look very carefully, you see Matteo Sun, it's the gospel of Matthew, Marco Sun of Mark, Luca Sun, written with an uh, eta, which uh, indicates the vowel harmony in the genitive suffix, of which I will have to say a little bit more later on, and Ioannis Sin with another vowel in the genitive uh, suffix. Well, that was Karaman Lirica. Let's move on. This is a map from around 1900. I forgot the name of the map. It was a very famous historical map at the time. So if anyone remembers or recognizes, uh, if not this map, then the name of the map where uh, it was taken from, I would be very uh, happy to uh, receive the information. This is um, an ethnographic map, as it was called. Uh, of the Balkans and uh, Asia Minor. Now, ethnographic, I presume, was based on language more than anything else because there was no DNA that could be tested at the time. Um, so I, I gather it must be on the basis of language. And you can see the blue area, of course, is where Greek was, uh, is spoken, or the dark blue area, not the light blue, that's the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and not this light blue area. These are lakes, uh, uh, so don't confuse them with areas where Greek was spoken. And by the way, because this is um, the Naylor Memorial Lecture, um, I also found this one, which uh, is almost from the same uh, date. This is from 1914. And uh, if you can read the upper part, it's carte uh, ethnographique. Uh, de la Macedoine, uh, you can see here the northern part of Greece and the southern part um, of the Slavic speaking uh, area. Uh, and you will not be surprised because you will know, of course, that uh, if you look at the green areas that extend into the northern part of Greece, that the uh, number of Slavic speaking people uh, at that time must have been very considerable. Uh, there are still pockets of Slavic speaking people uh, in Northern Greece. I believe uh, their language is called uh, Nashta, uh, which means ours. And I also think that I remember that there is some debate as to the um, relationship of the Nashta, Nashta speakers and whether they speak a Macedonian variety or a Bulgarian variety, or maybe even a South uh, Serbian uh, variety. You also see the purple uh, areas. Uh, those are Turkish speaking um, pockets. They're not really pockets. They're huge areas, especially here um, in Western Thrace, what is nowadays Western Thrace in Greece. There are still many uh, Turkish speaking um, Muslims that live there and continue to uh, speak Turkish. And here uh, as well, uh, also around uh, Thessaloniki, uh, Ataturk was born in 
Thessaloniki, which was a multilingual capital in the 19th century. Uh, so there's no real surprise here. These are, this is Albanian. Albanian extends well into Greece as well in the form of Arvanitika, um, which has been spoken in Greece for centuries. Uh, it extends all the way down to Attica and even the Peloponnese. These areas are uh, Romanian, or I should say Aromanian, uh, a language closely related to uh, Romanian. So this is all very interesting. And uh, again, I think this is, it will be more correct to call this um, uh, uh, a linguistic slash ethnographic map. Now let's return to, uh, to the other map because uh, I wanted to show you something in Asia Minor. As you can see here, of course, you see that, that there are large uh, pockets of Armenian speaking uh, people. Uh, Kurdish is spoken as well. That's the orange um, you know, stripes here. And Greek, of course, you see Greek here in the southern part, uh, here, here in Cilicia and here in the north, this area is uh, where Pontic Greek is spoken. It is still spoken there today by several thousands of uh, Pontians who call their language, they still call it Romaica. If you recall that um, the Byzantines called the Greek language Romaica and it is still called Romaica in, by those uh, speakers of Pontic who were not part of the population exchange between Greece and Turkey. So they are Muslims, officially at least. Now, you may be surprised, as I was, uh, that this area is there's not, nothing blue here apart from this lake, of course. Uh, this is Cappadocia. This is the famous triangle with Caesarea here. Um, and we know, or we happen to know, uh, that Greek was still spoken there at the time when the map was drawn. But um, apparently it escaped the attention uh, of the people who uh, wrote or made this map. Um, we, this is again the uh, map of modern Turkey, modern uh, Turkey with the triangle between Nevşehir, Nide and Kayseri here. This is the same triangle. Here is Nevşehir, which is actually now is from uh, Nea. And Shahir is Poli, so new, the new city, like Naples, which is the same main, uh, name basically. Caesarea is located here, and here is Nide at the southwestern part. And these um, black uh, dots are the villages where Cappadocian was spoken. And it's not really a great surprise that um, this had escaped the attention of the people who um, made this map and the sources they must have consulted uh, for the map because they these villages are more or less remote and the remoteness was probably one of the reasons why Greek survived uh, in those villages because all the other uh, parts of Asia Minor at least of Cappadocia were uh, Turkish speaking uh, at the time and even well you I didn't um, note the other villages, that there are many more villages, where Turkish was spoken um, around 1910. Uh, and of many of these, we actually know that the shift had taken place in the 19th century. So there was an ongoing shift from Greek to Turkish starting in, let's say, the 12th century uh, and well into the um, 19th and the early 20th century. And in all likelihood, Cappadocian Greek would probably have died out altogether if uh, this, it, the speakers of Cappadocian hadn't been uh, forced to move to Greece in the 1920s. We know about the Greek spoken in these villages, not because we have written records. Um, unfortunately, we don't. The literate Christians uh, in Cappadocia were all Karaman leaders, so Turkish-speaking uh, Christians who were able to write. They were not all literate, of course, but Karaman Lidika has a very rich literature written in the Greek script. Uh, whereas the remaining part of the population um, where Greek was still uh, used in addition to Turkish because they were all bilingual, 
um, around, around 1910, that is, um, they were illiterate. There were actually um, very few schools in many of those villages. And if there were any schools, they were installed in the 19th century uh, at the time where Greek nationalism became an important factor. And people started to realize that there were still Greek souls to be saved in Cappadocia. So they sent, uh, you know, teachers. Uh, a famous example is Sinasos. Uh, this is really um, a village. If you go there, it still has the feel of a Greek village. It had an important school. And the school obviously had a great impact on the nature of the Cappadocian Greek language as it was spoken in the 19th century. Uh, and all the villages where a school system was set up, you can see the influence of, well, we can't say that was standard Greek, but it was at least the kind of Greek that was spoken in, say, Constantinople, uh, Smyrni, Izmir, uh, etc., and the big cities that find, found its way into Cappadocia. And in a way, um, it Hellenized the Turkicized version uh, that was Cappadocian Greek. Um, now, how do we know about uh, Cappadocian Greek? Uh, how do we know what it was like at the time? Um, I will remove the two, the two circles for now. Um, we don't have any historical records, as I said, because the people were illiterate and so they didn't write anything down. We have some uh, 13th, 14th century uh, texts written um, in, uh, in, in Persian uh, by the, the Persian poet uh, Rumi and uh, his son Sultan Walid. Um, it's very difficult actually to read because it's written in the, uh, the Arabic or in the uh, Ottoman uh, version of the um, Arabic uh, writing system. And it's very difficult to actually know exactly what is behind um, this uh, Arabic script. But it's definitely a version of, well, let's say Central or East Asia Minor Greek, uh, as it was spoken uh, between Konya and Cappadocian, uh, let's say. But the evidence is very difficult to uh, decipher. We also have some other types of evidence, like inscriptions and in churches, which do have some features that you find in Asia Minor Greek dialects, but nothing like you know, real texts written by native speakers, which is very unfortunate because um, we are actually unable to follow the history of Cappadocian from say the 12th century uh, all the way down to the uh, 19th, 20th century. We do have some uh, descriptions made by Greeks, Cappadocian Greeks. They were all educated Greeks, um, some of them are priests, um, some of them are teachers. Um, and the descriptions are very interesting and also very important, obviously, but they are, uh, again, a bit difficult to interpret as far as the phonetic detail is concerned because the Greek alphabet is really not suited to uh, note all the sounds that uh, you find in Cappadocian uh, Greek that you don't find in Greek, as I will show you uh, in a minute. But we are very fortunate though, and here are the circles again, I forgot about them, uh, make a mental note. This is the village of Mishti, and Mishti is uh, one of the dialects spoken in the area. The dialects were so different uh, from one from the other that uh, it's very difficult to draw a dialect map uh, of Cappadocian Greek dialects because there was no standard language. All the villages had separate uh, sub dialect, so to speak. And you can say there was a northern variety and a central variety here and a southern variety. And you can even make um, a division between northwest and northeast and southwest and southeast. But there are many isoglosses that are uh, that cut right across these divisions, which makes Cappadocian dialectology a real challenge. Um, Mishti and its colony, as it's called, Charikli, uh, are two villages. And the dialects of this village are very close. This was uh, a colony, as, again, as they call it. So it's very closely related to the dialect of Mishti. And this is actually the only dialect that is still spoken to some extent 
uh, nowadays. So remember the name uh, Mishti because it'll recur later in my talk. We know a lot more about Cappadocian Greek thanks to this person, Richard McGillivray Dawkins, who wrote this wonderful book, Modern Greek in Asia Minor. It's really, it's, uh, it's a classic in its field. Uh, of course, if Asia Minor Greek is your field, um, it it's, contains a wealth of information on the Cappadocian dialects and also dialects of uh, other varieties um, in the area. Uh, a corpus of folk tales, which is, of course, the kind of text that people who were interested in dialectology uh, would collect in those days. And Dawkins, by the way, became one of the authorities of modern Greek uh, folk tales uh, after he wrote this book, Modern Greek in Asia Minor, which was based on travels he made in the area around 1910. And he said of uh, Asia Minor Greek, the body has remained Greek, but the soul has become Turkish. It's a very famous dictum by Richard Dawkins, which indicated the extent of the influence of Turkish on the Greek spoken in Cappadocia. And as a matter of fact, Cappadocia has become, um, well, one can say a very famous, if not textbook case of language contact, of a contact language uh, ever since uh, Thomas and Kaufman uh, uh, talked a lot about Asia Minor Greek in the classic on language contact published in 1988. And this is why I would like to uh, show you uh, some examples of the extent of the language contact in uh, Cappadocian Greek. Uh, so please uh, fasten your seatbelts because we're going to do some uh, linguistics right now. Uh, Cappadocian has lots and lots of Turkish loanwords. Uh, Greek has also lots of Turkish loanwords, but nothing compared to Cappadocian Greek. Um, and many of these loan words are loan verbs, which are usually thought of as being very hard to borrow. Um, let's give, uh, give you an example. Iste, mek, mek is the infinitive suffix in Turkish. Iste, the root means desire. And the borrowing takes place on the basis of the perfective past form. Uh, in Turkish, which is sometimes called the di past by Lewis, for instance, in his well-known grammar of Turkish. Uh, it's based on the third person singular, which in Turkish has a zero ending and is the basis for the inflectional paradigms. So the personal endings are attached to the third person singular, which, is, which has a zero ending. This is a phenomenon known as Watkins' law uh, on which uh, Brian and I have written a few things. Um, I'm not going to go into the details because that would take too much time, but you have to believe me on this. Um, I think that people uh, interested in uh, Turkish uh, loan verbs in the Balkans, uh, especially also in the Slavic, uh, South Slavic area will know that Turkish verbs always have this D suffix, which is really, um, a tense uh, aspect suffix in Turkish, that it recurs in the forms you find in the languages which have borrowed those verbs. So it's borrowed in the aorist, you get ised, disa, first person singular. The little plus sign has no linguistic significance. It merely, it's, it's meant as a reminder that there used to be a morphological boundary in, in Turkish, which is no longer there in Greek, of course. So this is the third person singular form. It has the S, which is a suffix to mark the aorist and then the personal ending. Um, one of the features of Cappadocian is that um, unstressed vowels are often syncopated or the syllables which contain unstressed vowels, especially I and U uh, are usually syncopated. So this form becomes istetsa uh, and there you see that nothing is left of the D suffix that we find in the Turkish form, but it reappears whenever the vowel is stressed. So in the subjunctive, iste diso, na iste diso, um, that I may desire, for instance, uh, you see the E recurring. And on the basis of the aorist, there are uh, two present stems are formed, iste diso and iste do. Um, again, this is uh, a Greek, uh, 
phenomenon, uh, present stems are usually based on the aorist, which is much simpler in the history of Greek. Uh, and this uh, aorist form actually allows you to form two present stems and you find both forms <clears throat> alongside each other, sometimes in the same text, uh, the bizo and the do. Izo is a very productive suffix in Greek. So um, it's to Greek ears, this really sounds like uh, as if it was a Greek verb as far as the ending is concerned. Now, Turkish has vowel harmony and the vowel harmony occurs in the suffixes um, uh, attached to the root. So if we take another uh, verb, yurul mak, retired, you see yurul du, uh, you have a different vowel in the suffix. And so in Greek, you get here, if you follow me, yurul tsa, et cetera, et cetera, you find a yurul duzo and yurul do, the contracted form. Um, but very often this U is changed to E because as I said, Izo, the is suffix is very productive uh, in ancient medieval Greek, etc. So the Uzo often becomes Izo. Here you have Aramak search, but yet another vowel here in the suffix Arad, uh, and then you find in the present Aradzo and its variant aradizo, which makes it looks again more like a Greek verb and arado. And this is the final verb, dushin mek with the fourth vowel dushin du, and then you get not surprising dushin duzo, and again dushin dizo and dushin do. These are uh, the different forms. So the, if you would think that this is vowel harmony, the suffix, remember that this vowel harmony comes from the Turkish. It was borrowed with the vowel harmony that went into the Turkish suffix. So this is not vowel harmony in the Greek forms because then you would expect it to occur in inflections and that doesn't occur. Or does it? Well, let's have a look at the paradigm. I'm sorry, I'm going to uh, you know, uh, you're going to see a lot of uh, data here. I hope you uh, don't mind. Don't worry, uh, I will explain them. So this is the aorist indicative, du shunsa, du shunsa, du shunsi, etc. This is what it would look like in a kind of reconstructed Cappadocian. But now let's have a look at the same paradigm in the dialect of Malakopi. This is Northwest Cappadocia. Never mind, you don't have to remember this. Maybe Brian's students have to. This, this dialect is characterized by vowel raising. Um, vowel raising means that unstressed vowels are raised to a higher position. Uh, in this case, e becomes i and o becomes u. So dushunces become dushunces. Dush, uh, this is not a raised vowel because it was there uh, to start with, but here you see these uh, um, S are raised to E here. Now that's all very fine. Vowel raising is, is a phenomenon, of course, you find uh, all over the world. You find it in Portuguese, you find it in Greek uh, dialects, in Northern Greek, uh, Greece, for instance. There's nothing uh, wrong with uh, raising a vowel uh, every now and then. It's one of those isoglosses that cuts, cuts across uh, the dialect boundaries. So you find it in one northern uh, uh, subdialect Malakopi, one central dialect, and one southeastern dialect, and all the other dialects don't have it. That's interesting enough uh, in itself. But now look at what happens. This raised e is subjected to vowel harmony in this dialect. So dushuncis becomes dushuncus, dushuncu, and here remarkably the final e, which is a result of raising this unstressed e is untouched. So the vowel harmony extends into the first syllable of the inflection, but not into the second one. I can only observe what Dawkins tells us because the dialect is no, not spoken uh, anymore. And if it were, I would be very surprised if they still uh, would you know, produce vowel harmony uh, while in Greece. But this is remarkable, uh, as you will uh, hopefully agree. This is the present indicative uh, of this, well, I call it a contracted form because behind the O is an A-O, historically, not synchronically. 
but this is the reconstruction, uh, let's say the uh, Cappadocian reconstruction for this type of the lone verb. And you find it, for instance, in Ularaj in Southeast Cappadocian, a dialect which is very heavily influenced by Turkish. And you see uh, th these are the forms. Uh, these final uh, S are deleted in this particular dialect. So we have Dushundum, Dushundat, etc. That will be the forms you would expect because this is really the vowel um and un you expect in Cappadocian Greek, as in Greek, by the way. But again, we find vowel harmony. Dushundum becomes Dushundum and Dushundun in the third person plural. Again, very remarkable because the endings are now, well, they are very difficult to identify as a Greek ending this way because of this uh, alien vowel in the inflection. And incidentally, if you look at the forms, um, you have homophonous forms here, dushin, dum, the first person plural of the present is identical with the perfective past first person singular, dushin, dum, in Turkish, and the third person plural of the present indicative is identical with the second person singular uh, of the uh, perfective past in Turkish, dushin, dum. That must, I can't imagine that this will ever have caused any problems in uh, communication because of course we're talking about Cappadocian system and this is the Turkish system. Uh, speakers who were bilingual and they were all bilingual will not have had any problems in using these forms uh, in, in the correct way in Turkish or in Cappadocian Greek. You can see by the way that the vowel harmony uh, extends to the personal suffixes in Turkish as well. Um, Turkish has, is an agglutinative language, which is very different from the fusional language that is uh, Cappadocian Greek. Uh, this is uh, the copula, the imperfect of the copula, immun, etc., in Greek. And this is, these are the forms that you find in Cappadocian Greek. And Brian, uh, I can't see you, but um, I hope I still have some time to continue because uh, time is going uh, you know, very quickly. Do I have some more time? Yes, maybe 10 minutes. 10 minutes, I'll skip, I'll have to skip this. I'm very sorry. I've been talking uh, yeah, too much about other topics. Uh, maybe I'll just give you an idea of what's happening here. Uh, if you look at the Greek forms and, and the Cappadocian forms, you will notice that it has a common uh, middle part and the personal endings, which are really Greek endings, if you look at the present forms, you see that they are really the end personal endings that you find in this type of the Greek forms, and they are attached to the third person singular. And if you remember, uh, the third person singular was had a zero ending and was in fact the basis for the entire inflection paradigm in Turkish. And as a matter of fact, this paradigm is built entirely on the model of a Turkish uh, paradigm. Um, this is the copula in the past form in Turkish with, uh, this is the past suffix. These are the personal endings and it looks as if this verb paradigm is built entirely on the Turkish one. Um, I have to go very quickly. Oh dear, that's very, I'm very sorry about this because this is so interesting. Here you find Turkish endings attached to the Greek personal endings, probably because the final part of these endings, the T looks very much like this part, the, the tense aspect suffix in Turkish. Uh, and so people who are fluent bilinguals, they might have unconsciously added the Turkish personal endings because they thought they heard, you know, a Turkish tense uh, aspect suffix here. I'm going to skip this, um, just have a look at this. This is a fusional paradigm of the word for Greek, uh, for woman in Greek, where you can see that uh, number and case are all fused in the endings. And here you have an agglutinative genitive plural, nekezu, woman plural genitive. You see, this is from Southwest Cappadocian. This is an entirely agglutinative inflection that was modeled on the Turkish. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is uh, exactly the same. The same for uh, 
the word for man, man, anthropon, here you have plural genitive. In this diet, you have atropos, ya, you, ya is plural, you is genitive. And the os, which was in fact here an ending in Greek, has been reanalyzed as part of the root. I'm going to skip this, just uh, show you very quickly that uh, Cappadocian has adopted the SOV typology of Turkish. Uh, Turkey is an SOV language uh, with a flexible word order, uh, by the way. It's not a rigid SOV language, but it has all the typological correlates, like pre-nominal modifiers. Here you see a relative clause, which the, uh, not weeps the child, the child that is not weeping, and then uh, its mother breast, not it gives, right? So this is uh, a pre, uh, here's the head noun, and here's the relative clause. It is not a Turkish construction, but the order is entirely uh, Turkish. And this is also worth mentioning the uh, zero article uh, in the nominative of animate masculine and feminine nouns in Cappadocian, that is a Cappadocian feature. You would expect an article here and it is dropped in the nominative. This is an example of two consecutive genitive modifiers, the house of the mother of a dev, a dev is uh, an ogre. Um, so you see, if uh, he came, na, this is the indefinite article, dev you, ogres, manayut, mother, his, and this is the uh, genitive suffix, this is the possessive suffix, and then the house. This is something you could never say like this in Greek, two consecutive uh, genitives uh, which modify each other uh, and then put them both uh, in front of the noun that would be impossible in Greek. Loan words, well, uh, the body has remained Greek, the soul has become Turkish. It's flooded with Turkish uh, loan words. This is the end of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and uh, as a result, in 1923, there was uh, the Treaty of Lausanne, but there was also the Convention of Lausanne, uh, which uh, determined that there would be a population exchange based on religion and that very many Orthodox Christians, Rum, as they were called in the Ottoman legal system, um, 1,200,000 approximately, 400,000 Muslims, amongst uh, whom were 40,000 Cappadocians, and you can see two thirds approximately spoke Turkish as the only language, uh, and 17,500 were bilingual in Cappadocian Greek and Turkish. This is uh, a picture of the exchange and no wonder even moving uh, pictures. There were uh, films made of the exchange. It's really a deportation. Now, is it dead or alive? When I started working on Cappadocian um, in about 1992, I think it was, um, I thought like anybody else that Cappadocian Greek was extinct. As you can see, this is from the ethnologue um, of those days, it's an extinct language which is interestingly classified as Attic Greek. Well, I think it's not really Attic Greek, but nevertheless. Also in the linguist list, this was captured in 2007, uh, extinct. Uh, so I was working on a dead language until in 2005, my colleague and friend, Dimitris Papazahariou from the University of Patras sent me um, a recording um, of uh, people speaking Turkish and Greek among each other, two very old men. And one of them said a very famous line, Pataram doikaf shea epki. That was the first time I heard Cappadocian after 13 years of having spent 13 years of my life working on Cappadocian, writing a comparative grammar of its dialects. And for the first time I heard Cappadocian. Um, and I knew what it was, and I even knew what dialect it was. If you follow me on this one, I'll just hyphenate the first word. You will recognize patera, father, and then doi kafshea epki. That is usually a bit tricky uh, to uh, see what it is. Maybe if I write it in Greek, um, no, not very helpful, but maybe this is helpful. This is a syncopated syllable. If we would transfer this into medieval Greek, which is Cappadocian is more closely, more, is closer to medieval Greek than to modern Greek, 
you get something like o pateras mu dodeka pedia epike. He made, this is the medieval form of the verb make, poieo in ancient Greek. It's disappeared completely in modern Greek, but in Cappadocian, as which, as I said, is more like a medieval kind of medieval Greek dialect because it was cut off from the rest of the Greek speaking world in the 11th century. And so the language was more or less you know, fossilized as medieval Greek. And it has many archaisms in the Greek component. You can see here is a, an article, the article is missing, uh, which is what we expect in Cappadocian Greek. But you can also see that it's a vowel raising harmony uh, uh, dialect. Instead of dodeka, you see doika and ep ke becomes epki. So we know that's one of the three vowel raising dialects. So it was fairly easy for me to determine what the dialect was. This is the modern Greek version of paterasmu ekane dodeka pedia with a different word order, not SOV. You wouldn't say it like that in modern Greek, although you could say o paterasmu dodeka pedia ekane. The article is missing, it's SOV. That looks all very much like Cappadocian. So, uh, of course, I knew it was Cappadocian. The word fshea is, that's a Turkish word. It's, it's an old Anatolian Turkish word, maybe derived from an old Turkish word for little. Uh, and you can see there are different forms of the plural in the dialects. And this one is found in only one dialect, the dialect from Mishti, the village that I circled uh, in the map of Cappadocia. So this must have, this would have been the dialect from Misti still spoken. And it was entirely Cappadocian, apart from one thing, the word for father is not pateras, which is the modern Greek word, but vava. So unfortunately, my uh, old man, not my old man, but this old man made a mistake. He used the Greek word for father instead of the Cappadocian word, which is, it would, he would have, he should have said, Vavam doikapshia epki. Unfortunately, I wasn't there to correct him at the time. We uh, went out to find more speakers and turned out that there were more than one speaker, actually uh, quite a, maybe a, a couple of hundreds. And if you count the semi-speakers, a couple of thousands of speakers here in one village near Larissa Mandra, uh, it, it's called, and two villages north of Thessaloniki, near Ayuneri, but you will find speakers all over northern Greece, Alexandrupoli, Kavala, Ceres, etc. And even here uh, uh, in the northwestern part, uh, Volos. And then there's, of course, an entire diaspora. Uh, I have one very good speaker and a very good friend, Thanasis Papanikolaou, here, uh, in, who lives in uh, Athens. These are some of the speakers. This is my dear friend, Lazaros Kotsanidis, who guides me uh, in the Cappadocian communities. This is uh, one of the speakers. Many of the speakers are unfortunately dead, like uh, these uh, old ladies who were very, very fine speakers. Uh, this is Lazarus' mother, uh, who spoke Mishotika, as the dialect is called, the dialect of Misti. Misti is called Mishotika. Uh, she would speak it with me. Her husband refused it until she had died. And then all of a sudden he started speaking Mishotika with me. And this is my favorite, Kaka Depika. She was very old and she was such a good speaker. If we have time during the discussion, I can let you listen to uh, a little clip of this one. The Cappadocians um, have become aware that their language is part of their heritage and that they should be proud of it. They weren't very proud because they were discriminated because of their language. Also, of course, because many of the people were bilingual, so they would speak Turkish as well, which was unacceptable when they were settled in Greece, but also in general because they were refugees from Asia Minor and they didn't look like the Greeks who lived in Greece um, in the 1920s when they were settled there. They gather uh, every year until last year when this uh, festival, annual festival was canceled due to COVID as well. It's called Ravushtima. And again, you will recognize the derivation. It's from a Turkish word, Kavushmak, to meet. And you see here are all the derivations. Kavushtuzo or Kavushtizo is 
uh, the verb, which means to meet. And in the, ver the diet of Mishti, it's pronounced differently. It has a fricative instead of a stop and the vowel raising, of course, here at the end, havushtizu, and this uh, gives a deverbal noun, ravushtima, which is derived from this uh, other present form that you will see here. And for the Hellenists among you, uh, this is a productive uh, derivation, ahapo, the word for to love in uh, Cappadocian and in this particular dialect has the deverbal noun, ahapima, which means love. Okay, I'm almost there. This is uh, a scene from the Ravushtima, one of the Ravushtimata where uh, I was. I normally go there and because I'm invited to give a speech in Cappadocian or in some Cappadocian dialects at the Ravushtima. And this is a screenshot. It's an older screenshot of one of the many Facebook pages uh, of Cappadocians. This one is interesting because um, it's called Anarxi Didascaliax Ekmathesis Tu Idiomatos Tu Misti, I think it is, because uh, the rest is missing here. And it's very interesting because this, um, this is actually a Facebook page where people um, can post anything, basically. Nowadays, you can find, hello, good day, good morning, how are you? And all kinds of wishes, uh, but its original intention was to present facts about the Mishotika dialect uh, to people who were descendants of you know, refugees from Mishti, but who didn't speak the dialect anymore, or couldn't speak the dialect anymore. And you find all kinds of questions um, like I have collected. One of them, it's interesting, I don't know why they pick ping penguins, you don't see, get to see very many penguins in Cappadocia, uh, and I don't suspect they uh, were ever there, maybe in one of the ice periods uh, a long time ago. And um, well, you can have a look at what is said there and try to figure out what it means. But this is an example uh, of one of the questions. It's about um, a word, chuval, and the people who ask the question says, I. I don't understand this aporia. I, I, it has two meanings. It means head and sack. How is it possible? Okay, well, here's an explanation. Chuval means head and sack. It has, in fact, it's two words. One is a Greek word, which is derived from kephali. Can you imagine kephali becoming chuval in Cappadocian, at least in this uh, sub-dialect? And the other is a Turkish word, chuval, which means sack, and which was borrowed. And as a result, the two words have become homonymous. And so this speaker had the idea that it was just one word. And you have all kinds of questions um, about this, also quizzes. Now there is uh, a book, which is a kind of Teach Yourself Mishotika by Thomas uh, Fates, um, a friend of mine, another friend of mine. and. Uh, the title of the book is very interesting. It says, Hyoros Asiharish. And this, no, I will skip this. I'm sorry. This is, I wanted to uh, show you that I can speak some Mishotika myself. But this is what it is, what the book's title says. Hyoros Asiharish. In Greek, it would be Otheos Nasasharisi. It means God bless you. But in Mishotika Cappadocian and in all the other Cappadocian dialects, you have similar expressions. But the word for God, which is theos in Greek, you wouldn't expect this word to be mutilated, if I may call it that way. Uh, it comes out as hyoros by a series of regular sound changes. It means God. It doesn't have the article, of course, because that is Cappadocian. But God bless you is used simply to say Thank you. And this is what I would like to say to you. Thank you for your attention and for bearing with me. Great. Uh, well, Mark, we thank you. Harish, uh, 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 and um, uh, let's all sort of virtually clap uh, for, for, uh, for Mark. I'm not sure whether he can see it, but, uh, but uh, we're certainly very pleased that you um, 
that you gave us such a rich and uh, illuminating uh, uh, talk. We do have time for questions. Your timing was great, Mark. Uh, what, we'll, uh, what we'll do is uh, if, if you have questions, um, you can put them in the, uh, in the chat and either I'll read them for you and let Mark answer, or if, if you want, we can elevate you to panelist status so that you can uh, ask the question uh, yourself. Brian, may I, there is also a question and answer section, and I see that there are already 17 chats. So maybe it's better to uh, ask the questions in the question and answer section. I'm, I'm look, well, I'm look, I'll be, right now there are no open questions. Uh, that, okay. was a, that was a comment from, from uh, before, but um, um, if, there, if anyone would like to ask a question, please, uh, yeah, oh, use, yeah, okay, use the Q&A uh, or, Raise your hand. Somehow indicate your your interest. But um, maybe I'll I'll start off though uh, um, to break the ice a bit, um, so that Mark, uh, uh, let me ask you if um, uh, if how you feel Cappadocian compares with other Greek dialects. I know that you focused m mainly on Cappadocian, but at the same time you've you've considered it in the context of Greek dialectology uh, more broadly. Uh, Maxime uh, notes that uh, from St. Petersburg notes that in Saconian, the word for head is, uh, is chufa with the some of the same vowel and consonant uh, uh, changes as, as the chuval that you, that you showed us. Um, could you just speak to the position of Cappadocian in the Greek dialectological scene? Yeah, so first of all, uh, Cappadocian is a very archaic dialect, which you can expect because it is one of the peripheral dialects uh, and not just peripheral uh, in the geographical sense, but also in the sense of an isolated dialect. And um, th the peripheral dialects are, are uh, Ciconian, Greco in Southern Italy, Pontic and Cappadocian in Asia Minor. There are some other varieties in Asia Minor and probably also Cypriot. I would think that Cypriot uh, counts as a peripheral diet as well. And then you have these, dialects in the Crimea, uh, which Maxime knows a lot more about. Uh, what you see in these dialects is that they, um, they are archaic, um, uh, as I said, Cappadocian Greek, and this, this uh, goes for Pontic as well. Pontic and Cappadocian are very, very uh, closely related. Um, and you can see that the Greek is really more like medieval Greek than like modern Greek. So they have been outside of the main developments to which uh, modern Greek and the mainland uh, dialects and also many of the, uh, the dialects spoken on the islands surrounding the mainlands and the Ionian islands. Um, we, should, we should distinguish the Turkish component from the Greek component, of course, because the Turkish uh, impact is, is very substantial. But as you know very well, Brian, uh, Turkish must have had a very uh, important uh, impact on Greek in general bec before the 19th century, before um, the Greek nation state was established and before actually the Katharevusa movement uh, started um, about, uh, which purified the language from uh, a lot of colloquialisms, but especially also from a lot of Turkisms. I know for, uh, for a fact that if you look at, for instance, plays from the 18th century, that you find many more uh, Turkish words and expressions and also many more interference phenomena in those texts than you would find in 19th, especially 20th century uh, texts. Um, the problem, if you want to connect Cappadocian and Asia Minor Greek in general to the uh, other modern Greek dialects, um, that it is very difficult to, to connect uh, some of the phenomena. Uh, for instance, they have for a long time, they have been uh, classified as uh, being part of the Northern Greek dialect group, as if there were a division between Northern Greek and Southern Greek, which was based mainly on phonology and phonetic uh, phenomena because you find this vowel raising, but it's very local uh, in, in Cappadocia. It's restricted to three dialects. And also because you've, you have the syncretism between the genitive and the accusative. So in uh, Cappadocian uh, and in Pontic, for instance, you find the accusative being used for direct and indirect objects, 
which is what you find in northern Greece as well. But I don't think that this says anything about real uh, dialectological connections. Uh, and now, of course, it's very difficult to connect these because the northern dialects have had uh, a history uh, which is continuous. Cappadocian has a continuous history as well, of course, but there was contact between Northern Greek and other varieties of Greek and the standard variety of Greek, uh, of course. And so it's, it's very difficult to compare Cappadocian as a kind of still version of medieval Greek to modern Greek dialects, which have evolved in a very different way and especially in a very different environment. Um, and I hesitate to say much more because there is another complicating factor, which is the constant population uh, movements in Asia Minor during the Middle Ages, uh, as, um, as you probably know, and as uh, the audience probably knows as well, uh, the Ottomans moved you know, large groups uh, about in their empire all through the Middle Ages. Uh, and we know, for instance, that there were um, population shifts from Cappadocia to Cyprus, which some believe has had an influence on Cypriot. I don't know if you can say that. I, I simply uh, know that there are similarities between Cypriot uh, and Cappadocian, but that might be uh, due to the fact that they all originate from the uh, Eastern Koine. And that is also a, a, a thing that has to be taken into account that modern Greek dialects, they uh, evolve um, not from ancient Greek dialects, with maybe Taconian as, as uh, you know, an exception, but they evolved from the Koine. And uh, as we know, there were local Koine uh, in the Hellenistic and Roman periods. And it is very clear that the Asian Minor Koine and Cypriot belong to the same regional uh, variety of Greek. So it's, it's, it's very difficult uh, because of these migrations to get a clear picture of the dialectology of Greek in that area. Also in Cappadocia, by the way, where you see movement from one village to another, uh, which even makes it very difficult to compare dialects and to get an idea of how pure a dialect could be, if any dialect can be pure, of course, in any sensible uh, sense, uh, that is. That's Great. a non-answer to your question. No, no, that's a that's a, a lovely answer. We have several uh, questions now, so it's a good thing uh, we I broke the ice because uh, it got things flowing. Um, I, I'm going to uh, at, I will I will read them to you, and I'll do it in, in an order which I think will have to, will uh, will be ones that can be answered uh, quickly first, and then and then the ones that maybe are more extensive. So uh, Bethany asks uh, first says, "What a wonderful talk! Thank you, Mark." Uh, I Thank wonder you. just how many children are learning Cappadocian Greek and what are the chances it will survive? Well, um, very few children. There are two villages, uh, as I said, one near Larissa in central Greece and uh, the other one is near Ayuneri in uh, north of Thessaloniki, where the language is still spoken to some extent and where you find some children. Uh, many of them will understand a bit, but when... Um, there is a documentary made um, about my involvement with the Cappadocians, which was uh, shot in 2013. And I uh, interviewed uh, some children. And typically you would find that in one family, uh, one child, in this case, I'm thinking of a boy uh, I was talking to who, whose Mishotika was really extraordinary. He, he could speak it very fluently, but his sister, little sister hated it. And that is of course, because in school, uh, they use modern Greek or probably a Northern Greek variety. They will have some, some kind of accent in schools, uh, which is to be expected. But the children is really, you know, the tricky part. The third village, Xiochori, where my good friend Lazarus uh, comes from, none of the children uh, speak or even understand uh, Cappadocian. Lazarus has three children. His daughter understands it a little bit. His sons do not speak it. And also, I think the interest is, you know, there's no big interest in a dialect, which is by, all, by any standard considered to be um, a low profile. Uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of social, it's very low on the, on the social scale. Uh, it is, 
uh, usually associate it's it has a negative association which actually is the reason why it's why so many people thought that it had actually died because people refused to speak it in the open they were ashamed themselves uh, which is something of course this is not peculiar uh, to Cappadocian this is something if you would talk to my colleague uh, here in uh, in Ghent who uh, is a Flemish dialectologist he would give you similar examples uh, and you will have similar examples if you interview uh, your Greek speakers in, in uh, Albania that when when you interview people when I talk Mishotika many Mishotis even the elderly people they will start speaking Greek to show that they can speak proper Greek and not this you know dialect that they were ridiculed for for, for such a long uh, period but the danger is and it, it's a real danger there is a slight revival now because there is a, a kind of interest in in the dialect, but more as a curiosity mm. it will never gain the status of a, a living spoken dialect anymore and because this, the children do not learn it we know that this is of course the surest sign uh, of disappear disappearance and it will disappear inevitably it will not disappear as such but it will just be absorbed into greek because that is if you listen even to elderly uh, people when they speak cappadocian it's full of greek mm -hmm. many people say that my Cap cappadocian pronunciation is better than theirs so that says a thing about so, uh, so, the state so, the so the future of the language rests on your shoulders well, uh, Yorgos uh, Yanakis asks if the various uh, present formations, the Dushun Do, Do Dushun Di, uh, Dizo uh, type, are they free variants or is there some distinction uh, that you know that you might notice? Well, it's very difficult to decide because uh, what we know about the um, most of the dialects we know from Dawkins and from from the older descriptions, um, and of course nowadays. It's, it's impossible to gather information about the productivity of one type or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, I got the impression that uh, but the material is just too scanty to know. I have the impression that it, there is a free variation. And sometimes you get the impression that a present stem can be formed on the spot. Uh, so sometimes in the same text, you will find forms in diesel and forms in do. Uh, side by side, and there's no real, I mean, I can't find any reason why this should be the case. Mm -hmm. So maybe the speakers weren't even, you know, aware of, of the difference. If you have, you, you find similar uh, phenomena in, um, in medieval Greek, where you find next to arapo, which is, by all means, this is one of the most important verbs of the Greek language, I love, right? But you find arapizo in medieval Greek texts. Uh, and if you think of it, arapisa is the aorist, and from arapisa, you could, you know, you could make a present stem arapizo as well as arapo, and this is apparently what people do. And maybe uh, speakers are not linguists; they don't think consciously, so they they may come up with you know uh, inconsequences mm. in our eyes, which are not really you know uh, uh, inconsequent behavior at all. There are just two ways to form the present stems. And I couldn't find you know, hmm. uh, any logical reason for you know, attributing one stem to this class and uh, the other to another one. OK, uh, thank you. Uh, Clayton, uh, a student in, in the linguistics department, asks, is there evidence of the morphologization of evidentiality in Cappadocian Greek as seen in other Balkan languages uh, and other languages in contact with Turkic, uh, such as Georgian? Yeah, that is a very interesting question. And unfortunately, I can't answer it uh, very well. Um, could, could you give an example of, you mean the evidenti evidentiality of the Turkish type? Yes, yeah, I think that's what he had in mind. Yeah, no, uh, there, there is evidence of the use of Turkish verbal suffixes. Um, for instance, you, you have, Occasionally, you find causative verbs which are formed exactly in the way by using a, a Turkish uh, causative suffix attached to a Greek uh, a root. I think um, there is a verb, psofatsen, uh, from psofau, mean, meaning to die, and psofatsen meant he killed, he, he caused some, someone or something uh, to die. But I've, I don't have any. 
idea about evidentiality. Mm -hmm. Nothing I can think. I'm sorry. That would no. be well, something. That, you would expect it there if you find it in the Balkans. You would, you would find you would expect yeah. to find it here. And it as does well. seem to it does seem to spread. Uh, so, uh, uh, Schwann, uh, another student in linguistics, asks: uh, Have the innovative features of Cappadocian ever been examined in the context of other regional contact languages, such as uh, Kurdish or Armenian or possibly Aramaic? Yes, um, Kurdish. I don't know about Kurdish, but uh, Armenian definitely. Uh, there is one phenomenon that I could have mentioned, but there are so many uh, interesting phenomena that had to be you know, left out of the presentation. But one of the things you find is differential object marking. Uh, now, differential object marking, you find it in some form in Armenian and in another form in Turkish. And you find the Turkish form uh, in Cappadocian. So an indefinite uh, uh, object uh, is, gets the nominative form in Cappadocian, which is remarkable. So the nominative of man is uh, Atropos or Athropos in Cappadocian. Uh, I see um, a man, you would say, Rano or Trano, Ena Aropos with the nominative form, which is the, it's the, the equivalent of the Turkish, um, you know, nominative slash indefinite accusative or the absolute form you find in a nominative. Um, which is definitely borrowed. But there's another phenomenon which is definitely not uh, Turkish. Uh, and that is that there is a, a, a differentiation, a division in the old inherited masculine O stems between animate and inanimate nouns. And this is probably something uh, there must be an aerial uh, explanation for it. I think there is something to be found in Armenia uh, as well. But I haven't looked into that, um, unfortunately. Um, but, but there are definitely other, uh, because Armenian was, of course, a very important language. It was spoken in the area. Uh, and I see Zazaki uh, coming up uh, from uh, Shuan Karim. Thank you. Uh, so there must be in the Iranian language is spoken in the area. And then Armenian, which was, I mean, Western Armenia was spoken in Cilicia. It, it was the a kingdom for a long time in the Middle Ages. So there must be many more uh, influences uh, and mutual influences uh, between Greek and Armenia as well. And let's not forget that um, Roma, the Roma settled uh, for, for a long time in Asia Minor, uh, and they took with them um, very many loan words, uh, Didilis, Christos Didilis from University of Thessaloniki, uh, uh, Jorgos will know about this, has uh, worked on uh, loanwords, Greek loanwords, which cannot be identified or not be connected with um, loanwords, with Greek words found outside of uh, Central Asia, Asia Minor. So they must have picked them uh, up th while they were staying there. I had a project uh, on the uh, Sprachbund in uh, medieval uh, Asia Minor but you need to have more people working on it and mm. for a much longer period of time. And uh, I don't know any Iranian language uh, and I don't know Armenian, so that is definitely a handicap. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's much more to be gathered uh, there as well. Thank you for the question. Well, we're, we're, we're running out of time and we are losing uh, uh, participants, but there are two questions. Uh, maybe you could just give brief answers uh, to them. Mm -hmm. From uh, Andre uh, Sobolev, uh, uh, are there any lexical borrowings from Balkan Romance, Balkan Slavic, or Albanian in these uh, dialects now? Uh -huh. the, uh, you mean in, the, in, 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 in Cappadocian yeah. now? Yeah. Um, I can't tell. Really, if there are, they would they would have been borrowed from uh, through Greek by mm -hmm. Greek. I, mm -hmm. I can imagine. So if if there are, and there must be many uh, borrowings uh, in 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 the northern dialects of Slavic words, and if they are incorporated in Cappadocia in in the in Mishotica especially, then it, they must have come by, via uh, Greek. But it's thank you very much for this question because I would like to ask a question myself. The name of um, um, the of Xirochori uh, is Gyordana. That's the original name. That's not a Cappadocian name. It was just the name of the village. Uh, and 
I know for a fact that Slavic people, a Slavic speaking uh, population lived in the village and they were driven out um, at some point and then uh, the Cappadocians uh, settled there. The name of uh, Neo Ayuneri is Varlanja. Mm. And the name of Mandra is uh, Tumai. And Tumai is usually connected to a Slavic form of the name for Thomas, uh, Tuma. Um, and Gyordana is usually connected with the female name Gordana, which I believe is, is found in South Slavic uh, as well. But that doesn't explain the vowel because it's G, it's an E and not an, an O. And Varlanja, I have no idea. Of course, it's very difficult to make sense of place names, but there are very many Slavic place names. I know in Northern Greece. Um, so yeah. if you have any explanation for that, I would be very interested. Okay, one last question then uh, from Maxime. Uh, if Cappadocians met other Asia Minor Greeks, Pontic, or uh, for example, which language did they use for uh, communication? Was it Turkish or or uh, Greek or something else? Um, yeah, that's a good question, um, which I, it's very difficult to answer. Um, Pontic Pontic is very close to uh, Cappadocian. I think that that there would be some mutual understanding. Uh, the older generation would probably automatically, uh, you know, turn to Turkish as a lingua franca, because they would both be speaking, uh, know that language, and that would be the easy way out. Nowadays, they would just use Greek to communicate. Uh, but in my experience, if, if you take uh, a taxi in Thessaloniki, uh, chances that you have a Pontic taxi driver are actually quite substantial. Uh, and I can, you know, communicate a few words, which... Um, you know, he will uh, understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the older generation, I would guess Turkish and the younger generation, uh, definitely uh, Greek. Great. Okay, I, 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 there are a couple of open questions uh, still, but they're uh, perhaps can be taken up with Mark uh, independently because I, I, I know that everyone has other things to go to and Mark, it's late at night for you, so we especially appreciate your your uh, staying up to. Uh... It's five o'clock in the afternoon. So oh, okay. Oh, okay. time 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 for a drink then. Uh, but in any case, let us all uh, thank Mark for a uh, a lovely uh, talk, lovely presentation, and uh, you have done done us proud with your uh, Naylor lecture this year. Thank well, you. Well, you made me proud by inviting me. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you. And thank you uh, all for. I wish I could see you. It's so, it's you know it's. So nice of you know to see uh, you know the audience. Uh, I was just talking to my PowerPoint, but <laughs> let's hope for better times. And uh, next time I come to Columbus, uh, I'm make sure that I will try to visit you as well. <laughs> thank you so much. Great, it was a pleasure. Thank, Brian. thank you, Mark, and thank you all for coming. Uh, it made for a great a great morning for sure. All right. Okay. So Derek, you can turn off the recording, I think. Um.